Okay, it's about four o'clock, and thank you everybody for, for, for coming. Uh, and also, most welcome to all of you who are listening in, which is a fairly large crowd, and those who are watching wherever in the world you happen to, you happen to be. Uh, this is the first on our side. We haven't done the financial stability report in this, in this form in the, in, in, in the, in the past, so let's, let's hope that this invention of ours adds, adds something compared to what we have done in the past and, and that you find, find this informative. And then, of course, once, once I'm through, Matthias Persson and myself, one, once we're through with the presentation, we can, we can discuss what's, um, what's in, the, in the report. So this time uh, around, the, the, the conclusion is basically that the banks, the Swedish banks, are, are resilient, and here we focus on the large, the four large, large, large banks, which is mostly what the ones we're talking, uh, talking about. Uh, but that resilience, uh, to a large extent, actually comes from what banks are doing in our part of the world and how they are dealing with, the, with their, with their uh, balance sheets, because we can't get away from the fact that there is considerable uncertainty in the world, in the world around us, and that, of course, also affects Swedish, um, Swedish banks in, in, in various, uh, various ways. But here we're really talking about um, possible indi indirect effects, because compared to many other banking systems, particularly in, in Europe presently, uh, there is no question about it. Uh, Swedish banks are very, very resilient, and that's what you also see when, when you look at the look at the stress tests or discuss other aspects of the numbers that we have put uh, put put together. So, Matthias, could you just continue? And As Stefan said, there is considerable uncertainty uh, in markets around the world, and maybe particularly in Europe. Uh, so, this shows just the borrowing costs for sov some sovereigns in Europe. And the uncertainty has implications also for banks in Europe and uh, probably globally. When it comes to the Swedish banks in this very uncertain environment and with high spreads and markets that are not functioning you know, like they're supposed to do, Swedish banks have full access to all the markets that they need to fund themselves. They have funding uh, even in short-term dollar, where many European banks find great difficulties funding themselves. So we are in a situation where the uncertainty is very high currently in the Euro and there is a lot of question going on. How will the European problems be solved and how is that going to feed back into the banks and the sovereign problems that a number of uh, the problems that a, a number of sovereigns have currently in Europe. As I said, the Swedish banks so far have full access to all the markets and full access to all uh, funding markets. So let me turn to Sweden. We have been arguing and discuss the developments in the Swedish housing market for some time. What we see currently is that uh, households growth uh, borrowing is uh, slowing down and the growth rate is coming down from a much higher level. Our expectation is that uh, households will continue to borrow but not on a slower pace than we have seen so far. And also the corporates where we have seen a pickup in the last couple of months and our view is that this will continue moving forward at the, uh, the borrowing from the, the corporate side will continue, although maybe on, on a bit uh, lower pace. And this has, of course, implications when it comes to the, the major s Swedish banks, where we expect uh, the profits to increase in our base case, uh, mainly driven by uh, continued loan growth, even if it's a, a, lower, a slower path, and also the fact that even if we have revised upwards uh, the credit losses for the major Swedish banks, it's still on a very low level. So all in all, this gives an impression that the, the Swedish banks are resilient. They have you know, quite, quite good profitability, and the losses in our base case seems to be you know, increased, but still on a, on, a, on a low level. When it comes to capital, the Swedish banks are, compared to many other European banks, well capitalized. Three of the major Swedish banks are on the top tier, and the fourth is you know, just above the middle. So when it comes from a capital 
position the Swedish banks are, are well situated in the market. And that is, of course, one of the reasons to why Swedish banks have access to funding markets today, where so many other European banks find great difficulties. And also the fact that Swedish banks don't have a lot of exposure to sovereigns where there is uh, fiscal problems. So in this report, we also do, do stress test. And I would say we do quite severe stress test from, from a macro point of view and even more severe than the EBA, the European Banking Authority, have done in their stress test. So we have negative growth in Sweden uh, in the major markets for the years that we do the stress test. And you know, the way we do the calculations, the Swedish banks turn out to have a bit lower capital, but still you know, being well positioned to, mag to withstand uh, a deterioration in the macroeconomic environment. This also strengthens our view that the Swedish banks are resilient. It also reinforces our view that the Swedish bank have access, partly because they actually have a good capital situation. And that's something that we will uh, come back to uh, later on. When it comes to liquidity, that's been something that we have raised uh, in the last two reports that we have discussed and where we think there, are, there have been uh, and there are risks. Just all the major Swedish banks have managed and increased the liquidity buffets. They have increased the position and they are today in a much better position than they were just a half a year ago. Uh, so they have length of maturity. This is the short term measure, kind of a LCR kind of measure. And as you can see the yellow bar, all the, the Swedish banks have improved their situation. Of course that's very good, particularly in a situation where we have big uncertainties in markets where there are a number of markets that are closed, then it's good to see that Swedish banks are increasing their resilience when it comes to funding and liquidity. Okay, so also this time we've come up with a number of, uh, number of recommendations uh, when it comes to our views on, on what, the banks, uh, what the banks need to, need, need, need to do in order to stay on the safe, safe side. And this time uh, we have we argue that uh, the banks should uh, maintain or continue to increase their current CET1 capital capital ratios. And there's sort of there are two parts to this. One is what was discussed last Friday in terms of making sure that 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 uh, the large banks should have a capital ratio which is uh, which is stay stay highs in the future in the, in in a, in a Basel III context. But setting the Basel III context aside, what we say here as well is that given the present circumstances, given what is going on in the rest of the world, it also makes, makes sense to make sure that the banks stay where, where, where they are as of now and, and, and um, continue to move, uh, move, move up their capital ratios. The other part of it, and we've, we've been talking about this for some, uh, some, some time, and this is an issue which wasn't discussed last, uh, last Friday, when the FSA and, and, and the finance minister also argue, uh, uh, gave their views on, 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 on future Basel III compliance in, in this country, we say that major Swedish banks should continue uh, to reduce their funding and, and liquidity, li liquidity risks. And if you look at the numbers and if you look at all the graphs in here, we're basically talking about the, the LCR and the NSF, uh, NSFR, despite the fact that uh, you can't really calculate, calculate them exactly to, to a Basel, Basel III standard as of today because there are various discussions going on uh, within the Basel framework presently. So, so we're talking about here kind of best up approximations on, 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 our, uh, on our side. And finally, we also think that, uh, that the major banks should continue to improve uh, their uh, public liquidity reporting and do the public, re, re, public liquidity reporting in such a way that it's, uh, it can be more easily understood uh, what their respective liquidity positions actually, actually uh, are. So uh, when it comes to doing these things, we think that at least from, from, from January 2013, CET1 should be at least 10%, and then continuing to 2015, it should go up to, uh, to 12, 12%. 
And uh, this is much quicker, actually, than, than in the bottle agreement, because there you have a more gradual process that ends uh, 20, 2019. Let me also here uh, explain that, in addition to this, uh, we have the counter-cyclical capital buffer, where some more works, more technical work, a lot more technical work needs to be done in order to sort out how to how to do that do that buffer and that means that eventually one should one needs to add that to to these uh, to, to these numbers to get the uh, get the get the, get get the total but then uh, on the uh, when it comes to liquidity the Basel committee has said do lcr from 2015 we think that 2013 is more proper in our our, our environment and then the other one, uh, which is dealing with LCR and different currencies, and here we mainly focus on, on, on uh, euros and US dollars. That's not a topic at all in a Basel III context, but we do feel quite strongly that, that we should uh, do an LCR also in, in, in euros and, and US, US dollars, and that system should start already 20, 2013. And we find that very reasonable given given the Swedish environment and given that Swedish banks are, uh, get so much, uh, so much of their funding from, uh, from other parts of the world in euros and in, and, and, and in dollars. And finally, we have the chart with the, with the donuts in different colors. And, and this is just basically saying that uh, we do think that the liquidity reporting uh, needs improvement in such a way that there is more standardization and in such a way that, that there generally is more, uh, more uh, reporting uh, period in such a way that you actually can compare these numbers between, between different, uh, di different banks because that would be quite, uh, quite helpful. And that, that is particularly so in a European environment where liquidity has been an issue for several, several years already. And we find it very, very reasonable to, to, to improve on this because uh, we do think that it's important to, to uh, bring clarity uh, to these issues because clarity in this environment uh, reduces uncertainty and uncertainty is something which is not a good thing in terms of uh, uh, funding, funding opportunities and uh, this will be to the advantage we feel uh, for the Swedish uh, banking sector as, uh, as a whole. But all in all, uh, these are some of, some of the issues that we suggest and that we've been working on for quite, quite some time. Uh, we have also extensively discussed these issues uh, with, the, with the FSA because when it comes to uh, practic practical implementation, part of it rests with the FSA. And when it comes to the capital charge, part of it rests with the finance ministry in terms of de dealing with the... Uh, dealing with the dealing with the legal legal framework, but uh, all in all, when we look at this stress tests uh, included, our conclusion is that uh, it's a bit uh, messy in other parts of war in, of Europe, uh, but in our part of the world, the banks are resilient. So, uh, so much uh, of an introduction. Has been uh, now, uh, questions, reflections on on this. Um, Andreas Åkansson from Exxon BNP Paribas. First question on the countrycyclical buffers. Um, because zero, two and a half percent is of course an awful lot of money for the banks. And given the credit growth we've seen over the last several years and the record household debt to GDP, is there any reason we shouldn't believe that the banks should have to comply to some sort, of, some sort of buffer already from 2013, if you can have a view on that? Second question. Um, you're talking about the banks having access to funding today in all markets, which I'm not quite sure that's correct in all markets, actually. Covered bond funding is a very important source of funding for the Swedish banks today. In some countries, the regulators are looking to limit the amount of covered bonds the banks can do in relationship to total liabilities and so on. Are you looking at the risk of being overly reliant on covered bond funding today? Thanks. On the first, first issue, when it comes to the countercyclical buffer, had we had one, then I'm pretty sure that it would have been enforced by now. And, 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 and we have a graph in there in the, in, in, in the report right now. I don't, don't remember exactly on which, which, which page, page it is, but it, it clearly shows what, what things would have looked like. And, and one way of thinking about this issue is to sort of think about it in, in a way which is actually quite similar to the way you argue about the output gap 
uh, when you when you uh, deal with the deal with monetary policy because basically the techniques that you would use are are actually quite uh, quite similar to those techniques but then whether 2013 is the year or not i don't have an i i, I don't have an answer to that uh, to that issue as of as of today then the other part when it comes to bonds covered bonds and how you basically how you compose your liability side or to what extent you actually move move some some of these things out of out of the balance sheet altogether it's just too it's just too it's just too, too early to tell what happens in europe as a whole is that that the whole all banks in europe are going to have to face this issue one 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 way or the one way or the other because it would be quite unlikely if the balance sheet structure of all European banks were to re revert to, let's say, 2006 or 2007 compositions, uh, given what now has happened. So, so we are like, most likely heading into an, an environment where it wouldn't surprise me if there will be substantial changes in, in, in various parts of Europe. But then what that exactly implies for, for Swedish banks in the near, in, in the near future, that's uh, that's too too early to tell. Let me just add on, on uh, the second part. I think, you know, first I think that when you look at the senior unsecured that has been issued so far, there has been Swedish names actually issuing. Uh, and compared to many other European banks, uh, U.S. money market funding is still available. So you know, our, our view, sh sure, some markets are you know not functioning perfectly. You know, that's understandable. But the view we have on the Swedish banks funding and liquidity is that they have full access. Of course, there are, that has been implications on prices and maturity and things like that. But, you know, that's what's going on in markets. And that's, it's better to have access than not. When it comes to the, the issue about cover bonds and uh, subordination, that is an issue. Uh, that is being discussed. However, when you, when you look at the Swedish banks, we are not that concerned yet that they have reached a level where subordination is, is too high uh, of the balance sheet. Certainly, you know, if you look at other countries like Australia, sure, there, there is regulation, but they haven't had the instrument as a funding vehicle, so it's just been introduced. But it is an issue, it is being discussed. As I said, I don't, our view is that from a Swedish perspective, we haven't seen that, that level where we are worried. But, you know, cover bond will be important moving forward and out of this crisis, but it's not the holy grail. There needs to be other funding sources as well. I'm Matt Sanderson with Chevra. Uh, I would like to return to the, to the um, counter-cyclical buffer a little bit to discuss, um, and I understand it's a discussion as no decisions has been made, but uh, what would it look like? I mean, is it, is it, uh, would it be something the authorities would say on January 1st that uh, it will be in place with 1% that's a, at the end of December, December the same year? Uh, would it be different for different banks or would it be equal for all banks? Um, I mean, things like that I would appreciate if we could have a little bit of... Just to, uh, no, I don't have an answer to that because we don't have all this stuff in the, in the stability report this time around. It would be awful nice to have, but since it's not in there, I, I don't have a good reply when it comes to doing this. There is an awful lot of technical work that needs to be done on, on, on this particular topic and, and, and we need to do our homework in this country but the same holds actually for all other countries. And that means that, let's say, in a kind of a European context, eventually I expect some, some degree of standardization to, to emerge out of those, uh, those conversations. But, but uh, those conversations have not been carried out yet. And that means that it will take a while to get, get, this, work, uh, get this work done. No, so I think you know, this will, uh, this will probably take some time. As Stefan said, there is a lot of work that needs to be done. There is a lot of work currently being done, but having that implemented just overnight, I, I find that very difficult, you know, to see that happening. And also in Sweden, there is a parliamentarian commission looking into who will, who will actually decide on the counter-cyclical buffers. We don't even know that. And that uh, commission is support, you know, supposed to report back to, to government uh, in... Uh, end of August next year. And uh, you know, even then, I don't think we will have all the answers uh, to your question. And if, if I did sort of deduct from what you're saying, that means that I should not expect this to come into action uh, for at least three years. Well, whether it's three years or any other number, I don't know, but definitely not for the next six months. 
that's, that, that's for sure, because there's just too much technical work that needs to be, uh, needs to be done to, to, to deal with that, to deal with that issue. I mean, and there are sort of, there's very basic questions that, that one has to ask oneself here, sort of like, where are we in the cycle? What cycle? And if we can answer those two questions, then who's to decide? And that means that there is plenty of homework to do when it comes to figuring, figuring that, one, that, one, that one out. And of course, you said we don't have to be concerned for the next six months. But of course, our concerns is the next 13 months. Okay. So, <laughs> thank okay. you. Hi, I'm Walter Deutsche Bank. Uh, a couple of questions, if I may. First, going back to the countercyclical cyclical buffer, it's pretty obvious that uh, in a year's time or so, the gap, the credit to GDP gap, will still be way above 2% here in Sweden. Uh, we will perhaps not have a very strong economy here then. Uh, if we look at the philosophy behind implementing this kind of uh, buffer, uh, it is supposed to not to be pro-cyclical, rather it is uh, supposed to prevent too strong credit growth. In your world, is it is it still correct to implement a buffer like this then in an environment where the sort of the, the strong credit growth has already happened and we are in uh, a, a poor economy? So that's my first question. Thank you. It's just too early to tell because time will tell and, and, and one day we're going to have to to pass that, that, that bridge. But let me answer in more general terms when it comes to Putting in, pla putting in place various regulatory frameworks. Uh, you can, somebody is always going to argue that the time is not right, regardless of when you put these, these and other measures in place. And if, 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 you st if you start from that angle, then things tend to never get done. So you're just going to have to deal with the, the, the whole adjustment, the, the adjustment period and, and, and live with a few imperfections uh, when it comes to these, these, these types of topics because uh, most, of, most unfortunately the stars are almost never aligned in such a way that there is a perfect time to, to do, do, do these things and one, one just have to live with those, those types, of, types of imperfections. My other question regards to uh, the stability report and where you propose dividend restrictions if a bank falls below 12% uh, quarter one. Uh, are there any other restrictions if you fall below, below that, that threshold? Well, basically, the way the system works, that it gets worse and worse the further down you go. And that means that eventually it's up to the FSA to, 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 to decide and limit this, that, and this, that, and the other. And the further down you go, then eventually, I mean, the, you, 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 you lose the bank. So one way of, without getting into sort of the technical details, and because this is stuff that has to be written up, uh, when, when various things will happen, we are moving into an environment which is uh, very much sort of similar to what they've had in the U.S. for a long time, the fiducia system, where basically the issue in the past for us has been that you sort of go, you fall below 8% with the present set of rules that we have, and then basically you are supposed to withdraw the license, but then that creates an issue because normally there's still some capital. Suppose you end up at 79 then, 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 then what, what do you do? So we need something more gradual than what we have had in the past because that was already in the early 90s when some of us were struggling with this, that was an, an issue. It's unfortunate that this issue hasn't been settled over the past 20 years, uh, but now this is a wonderful opportunity to put in place something, something better than what we have had in the past. Thanks. And the final question is, uh, regarding banks which are not among the four big banks, there are other financial institutions in Sweden with a balance sheet of 350 billion or so and which are totally dependent on the capital market. Could you please elaborate a bit why they are not uh, deemed as systemically important? I don't hear you. Sorry, is, yes. that, is that mic on, Jan? Is the mic on? Because yes, yes. I don't hear you. On the... Okay. Should I repeat the question? Or yeah. yes. 
Uh, the question is regarding other institutions which have significant balance sheets and which are dependent on the capital market. Uh, why do you not see them as systemically important uh, in this at this point in time? Thank you. Yeah. So the question was: that there are other institutions in Sweden that are, are, are you know, of of, of other sizes, uh, smaller than the major four major banks, but still rely a lot on on uh, capital markets for funding. So why don't we uh, raise capital for for them as well? That was the question, right? I think what we had said. Uh, and communicated last Friday with uh, the Ministry of Finance and the government and the Swedish FSA was that, you know, we don't rule out that other might be uh, for the sa same rules as the ma four major banks. However, at the, uh, our view is that the four major banks are systemically important at all times. Other institutions might be, it. you know, if you look at our history, what happened after, after Lehman Brothers, we gave lender of last resort to Kauting Bank, we gave lender a last resort to, to Carnegie Bank. I, I'm quite sure we wouldn't have done that if the markets and the circumstances were more normal. So what's systemically important might vary over time. But the four major banks are systemically important. So what, what's going to be the case for the, the, all the other banks in Sweden is that they have to comply with Basel III from January uh, 1st, 2013. Basel III full implementation. Uh, of, of the capital. So uh, when it comes to liquidity for the, for the other institutions, this is something that we have, where we have asked uh, the Swedish supervisor to actually move forward and a faster implementation, as we mentioned earlier in the presentation, for, for stricter liquidity regulation. Uh, yeah, Thomas Johansson at Carnegie. Hi, can we ask questions on the telephone function? Sure, I mean, just Hold on, just to, I'll, 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 I'll talk to you people just in a minute. There's one more question from the floor, and then we'll, we'll, we'll move on to you who are listening in. Yeah, yeah on the issue of the uh, net stable funding ratio and liquidity coverage ratio, uh, what's the FSA's opinion here? I mean, you want to introduce it in, in, in various currencies. And also, kind of a follow-up on, on that, what, how would that impact the banking operations? Do you think, are there any businesses they would have to close or scale down, or is this merely an issue of, of raising funding, say covered bonds in the US or, or so on? So the question was LCR and net stable funding ratio and whether or not that has some implications, and in particular in different currency for LCR, if that has any business implications for the Swedish banks. No. Uh, first, I think that uh, you know, the Swedish FSA is share our view, I would say. I think that we argue that uh, the Swedish uh, FSA should implement this in January, 1st of January 2013. <clears throat> and you know, the, way, the way I see it, you know, looking at what the Swedish banks have done recently, I think they have been quite prudent. They have increased their liquidity buffers in, for example, US dollar. You know, going from a to a more resilient position today. So I don't think that they have to uh, change their business strategy, but that's a decision that the banks need to take. Our point of view is more that the, the Swedish banks, the Swedish financial system is reliant on ma market and wholesale funding. That needs to be, that risk needs to be controlled. And we are suggesting, and we think it's a good idea to implement LCR in euros, in dollars, and also as to aggregate. Is it the case that the majority of short-term funding is raised in, in U.S. dollars, and that is used for, you know, trading operations and, and other stuff as well? I mean, banks are different, and banks choose different this different strategy. But eventually, if you put these these uh, these rules in place, you're going to have to spend more time thinking about how you run your business in such a way that you have matched positions on, on, on your when it comes to your assets and liabilities. And we do think that that is that, that is important. If you look at the bar charts that we have in the report, it's perfectly clear that, that banks have changed their behavior in the past 12, 12 months, and, 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 and already that is a good thing, thing in, it, in, 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 in itself. And it's important that, these, these, that you meet these measures over time so that they will be binding, and that's the whole point. Uh, because that ensures that the system doesn't all of a sudden drift in a, in a, in a direction uh, 
uh, which is eventually is, uh, is no good. Because I do think that experience tells us over the years that most unfortunately markets tend to function the worst when you need them the most. And uh, people tend to forget that. And then somebody else has to tell market participants that that's what that, that, that you have to have you have to stick to certain certain limits here because otherwise you run the risk of having risks in the system as a whole going up going up too uh, too much and basically it should take longer before banks end up here and, and I also think there is a if you look at today there is no commercial paper market in Swedish krona and the reason is that the US dollar is cheap so everybody is you know funding themselves short-term US dollar, swapping it back to Swedish krona. And I think that's very, that's a short-term view. You know, if there are regulatory changes, if something happened to the US money market funding, uh, then they need to move them back home and fund themselves again in Swedish krona, and there is no market. I don't think that's a sustainable, you know, long-run uh, process of actually having it. That needs to, you know, I think the bank should consider, ma you know, maintaining a Swedish market where there actually is a commercial paper market in Swedish krona, and that would also take care of some of the problem. It's not only for trading. There are, there are other purposes where they, can, where they actually use the, the swapped dollar or euro. Yeah, I guess that was my whole point, that there's really no, no short-term Swedish market. No. But is there demand in the, in the market for that kind of short-term instruments? That's a pricing issue. Now, let's see. We had a question from someone listening, listening in. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, this is uh, Chintan Joshi from Nomura. Uh, I have uh, two questions uh, for you. Um, the first question, uh, Rick Spank and the SSA have uh, introduced uh, capital regulation uh, that is stricter uh, than what was proposed earlier in the year. Um, the cost of this regulation, wholly or partly, uh, will be transferred to society at large. Uh, I'm just wondering how Rick Spank thinks about uh, uh, the cost of this regulation uh, that is being imposed uh, and the trade-off between the cost and the benefits. Um, and the second question uh, is, uh, uh, last week, uh, Rick Spank said that it expects uh, uh, that the new regulation, um, that with the new regulations, uh, the risks of the banks will reduce, and therefore uh, the cost of equity should also reduce, which should justify a lower return on equity. Um, does the Rixman think that this can happen uh, in the current markets uh, where uh, even by the new systemic risk measures that you've introduced, uh, uh, risks are, uh, are pretty high, uh, implying that investors won't be very willing to reduce the cost of equity uh, just yet? Maybe in the long run, uh, uh, but in the long run, we are all dead. So uh, just wondering how you're thinking about uh, that, those two things. Okay, first, uh, the first one when it comes to costs, uh versus benefits. Uh, these measures are highly beneficial to society as a whole. Uh, because by doing this in, this in this way, we reduce the likelihood of a major disaster. And we do know from experience over, over, over history that over time that when that happens, we're talking about basically negative growth in the economy for several years because it takes takes a number of years to sort out those types of, ty types of messes. And, and if you can re reduce the likelihood of that happen, happening, it's a, it's a low probability, high cost event. And, and when, you do the num when, when, when you do the numbers, and we'll shortly get back to that and, and, and put out more, more sort of technical, technical material on that, on that particular, particular topic, it's clearly beneficial to society as a whole to to make sure that, that uh, capital is uh, higher than what it has been, been in the past and to get it, get it up to those levels that we're talking about now. This is actually what you also find in, in a number of other countries where they have done, done the numbers, if I, call it, if I call it that. Then return on equity in the short run, that's harder to answer because I'm not in the equity market. Maybe, maybe Matthias has a better answer. No, I think that on short term, I, I'm not sure, you know, we don't really have a view on, on return on equity. I, I can understand that you have that. And, uh, but I think with higher capital, one of the, the f effects that we will have is that the risk will go down. And if you look at how Nordea communicated a couple of weeks, you know, maybe a week or two weeks ago, when it was announced that they were on FSBs uh, 
globally systemically important financial institutions, their comment was that, good, funding cost is going down. And I think, you know, there is a, there is a, so if capital goes up, of course capital is more costly, but also funding costs will, will come down. And that would, the net effect is hard to see, you know. How, what will the net effect be? And this is, as the governor said, we will come back to this issue on uh, the welfare implications uh, later on. If I could just follow up um, uh, with regards to the answer to the first question. Um, uh, these uh, capital and liquidity regulations uh, uh, do impose uh, costs on the banks, and they are uh, kind of passing them on to, to, uh, to their customers. Um, what, do you think this will have uh, some kind of uh, effect on economic growth in the short run? Well, in the short run, as we state this today, the banks are already well capitalized, and this is still despite the fact that we have speeded up this compared to, to the Basel Agreement, a, a process that, that takes, it takes a number of, of, of years to, uh, to come to complete, and that means that in terms of the growth numbers, this is not an issue as of today. No, and also if you look at what we actually suggested together with the, the ministry, the government, uh, slash the government and, and the Swedish FSA, you know, the major Swedish banks, almost all of them, already today fulfill the requirements of, on capital for 2015. And banks are already today having return on equity. Uh, you know, so this shouldn't be, a, even with very conservative assumptions on earnings moving forward to 2015, this is not, shouldn't be a big problem. And two of the, at least two of the banks have also communicated that this will not be transferred to higher margins in, for example, mortgages. Well, we'll, we'll have, wait and see, you know, how that will actually play out. But that's what's been communicated. Thank you. <coughs> yes, um, good morning, uh, or good afternoon. Uh, Richard Hansen from, from ABG. I have a couple of questions that is not explicitly spelled out in the report, of course. Uh, firstly, if we can start with the risk weights on mortgages. Um, you, you mentioned that, but you don't go into any solutions. We know that the FSA are working with that. Uh, my, my question is, how are you participating in, in, in that work? Um, what's what's uh, Riksbank's uh, role in it? Uh, s secondly, um, what do you think about your Nordic fellows? Um, will they also... Um, take a similar view on the capital levels. If they don't, what do you see about, uh, what do you think about competition? Because that will kind of change the competi competitive landscape. Thanks. The first question was, what about the risk weights on, 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 on mortgages and who is doing what? What is the central bank doing and, and, and what, is, what is the FSA doing? When it comes to the formal aspects of this, uh, this, uh, this is an issue for the, for the FS, F, 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 FSA. Uh, but we have for quite a while actually advocated higher risk weights and, and find it reasonable for the FSA to, to work, on, work on that and, and they are also working, working on it. And, and when it comes to the type of expertise that you need to have to reflect on, on these types of issues, we're working to, uh, together, together on them. Then finally, at the end of the day, when it comes to the formal aspects of it, it's, it's up to the FSA to... Uh, to decide, but, but we have, our view is that uh, a review of the risk weights is, uh, is, uh, is long, uh, long overdue. The second question was, what about the other Nordic, uh, Nordic countries? Uh, we have a group among Nordic and Baltic central banks and FSAs where we discuss these types of, these types of topics, and, and in the course of the year, we'll get back to this issue and discuss some more. Uh, within, within this group of countries when it comes to how, how to deal with these issues. But ideally, uh, we should get to a point where there is a, a fairly high degree of coordination, if I call it, uh, call it that, because given that we have such a high level of cr cross-border activity in this, in, in, in this region, uh, it's, uh, it's reasonable to find uh, solutions that are uh, reasonably uh, in the same in the same uh, ballpark, but it's it's too early to tell, and we have to we have to get back to uh, get back to that in the in the coming in in the coming years. But one way of looking at it is to say that uh, these are not issues unknown in the other countries. 
So, so in that sense, it's, uh, my guess is that it's more or less high on the agenda in, 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 this, uh, in, in this region. Because basically what has happened here is that another way, maybe it's oversimplifying to say that if you follow the G20 agenda and if you follow the FSB, Financial Stability Board agenda, uh, there they worked for quite a while together with the Basel Committee on the G, uh, GCFIS that Matthias uh, talked about dealing with globally systemically important financial institutions. Now, the next step in that process is to move into, into uh, a discussion about how to deal with national CIFIS. And, and de facto what we have done in our case is already stated that we do think that, that we need something extra when it comes to national CIFIS. So, so we are kind of ahead of the curve in, in, in terms of doing, do, doing the work here. And then we have this kind of in-between uh, situation where in, s in some cases uh, banks are regional CIFIs and that, uh, that type of issue we have to deal with uh, in a Nordic-Baltic uh, Baltic context. Can I just a very short follow-up? Uh, COCOS and, and other kind of hybrid instrument, is that totally off the table, your capital views? Well, in the sense that if you look at the numbers and how we have presented this, uh, uh, and now I'm talking for myself because this issue hasn't really been discussed, if people want to add cocos on top of what we have suggested, we are fine with that. <laughs> but I'm not talking about cocos as an alternative to, to what we have suggested. Francis Dallaire, Pareto Eman. On the total uh, capital ratio, uh, will that be applicable from 2013? And, and what will be your view on the existing instruments, the uh, tier two? Uh, will they be uh, rec recognized and, and will the grandfather uh, amortization be valid for, uh, from 2013, from your point of view? Uh, and perhaps a second question, if I may, uh, on, on the household indebtedness uh, in Sweden, which seemed to have accelerated last time the Swedish Riksbank lowered interest rates. Um, do you consider the set of result, the, the measures that you have, that are considered like the risk weighted asset on household, higher capital requirements, that this would perhaps um, uh, help you in, in ensuring that if you have to lower interest rates in the coming months, that um, it wouldn't necessarily push the banks into increasing their lending to household in a way that would make financial stability perhaps uh, 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 that would threaten financial stability. Should, should we see all of that as something that would um, uh, perhaps strengthen financial stability overall in Sweden? So I'll take the first, you take the second. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the first question was about total, total uh, capital and what will happen to grandfathering of tier two and, and that, that will be grandfathering from January 2013. That will be implemented as it has been discussed earlier. And uh, no, exactly how that will play out and we are still waiting for the regulatory, the legal process and how that will be implemented. There are still discussions in Europe. You know, will it be maximum harmonization or not? And, and there, is, there are some things that need to be addressed and where we don't have full clarity. But it will, our view, the Swedish, all the authorities have, have the same view that will be grandfathering up tier two from January 2013. Well, the, other, the other question was, uh, what about the, the household sector and, and, and then particularly mortgages and how do we, how do we deal, with, deal with that? Uh, one way of reflecting on this topic is to say that, well, it took a while to put in place the LTV ratio, and uh, that's a good, good measure, and it's a bit too early to tell whether it really has worked or not, but things seem to be slowing, slowing down, and uh, maybe the LTV had something, something to, do with, to do with that. That increases resilience in the household sector. At the same time, um, loans to disposable income, the debt ratio has gone up. It's around 170, maybe 175, something, something like that today. And that 
cannot and should not continue up, up, up indefinitely because then eventually uh, one day you end up with the problem. The hard part of it is, is, is of course, to decide when enough is e enough. But, but clearly the LTV ratio is a, is a good, good, good measure when it comes to, comes to dealing, de dealing with that part of it. The other part is the capital charges that we're talking about today because those, they increase the resilience in the banking sector. And then the third part is the liability side of the bank, banks and the funding side because here we, you have the net, net stable funding ratio and you have the liquidity coverage ratio. And particularly if you, if you, if you move them and apply them for individual currencies, that also increases the stability in the system. And given at, the one, at one end of this, you have the household sector and you, you, you'd like to see household not borrowing too much. And then you have the LTV. And then at the other end, you have Swedish banks funding themselves using, let's say, just for the sake of the argument, U.S. money market funds. And then it makes sense the way we think about it to impose an LCR uh, to, to make it safer on, on, on that side. So we ha you have kind of the, the various bits and pieces in this, but, but all of them add up. Uh, and and from, from, um, add up in the sense that in various way, ways they increase the, the, uh, the, the strength and the resilience in the, system, in the system as a whole. But then the other part of your question was kind of more about monetary policy, and that's, uh, uh, that's not the agenda of today. That's a completely different, uh, different uh, conversation uh, two, three weeks down the road. Hampus Brodén, SBN Skilda. Questions online? Uh, there's one question from the, from the floor, and, and we'll take you, whoever you are next, okay? In the extremely hypothetical case that there is a very large non-Nordic bank that is acquiring a Swedish bank and making it a fully uh, sort of included uh, branch of, of that very large foreign bank, what would actually happen? Would, would that new bank uh, be exempt from the 5% uh, systemically important add-on? in which case it would be a regulatory arbitrage to buy a large Swedish bank. No, so the question was if there is a foreign bank uh, entering the Swedish market, buying maybe one of the Swedish banks and, and it's a branch. Uh, I think, you know, as you said, it's a hypothetical question. Uh, I'm not sure if we will see, see that happen, but, uh, you know, we will, we will solve that when, when that problem arises. I'm sure that somehow we will make sure that, uh, you know, that, that is taken care of. Okay, now there was a question from someone listening in. Please go ahead. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, Nick Davey here from UBS. Just wanted to thank you again for hosting this conference call. I've got two quick questions, if I can. Um, the first is on your structural liquidity measure, so the net stable funding ratio equivalent. Um, it's quite striking, I suppose, from some of the charts that you put in your report that uh, clearly the Swedish banks screen poorly on this metric, and indeed one of them... Uh, seems to have the biggest maturity mismatch in Europe uh, as the ratio is currently calibrated. So I suppose my question to you is, how developed do you think this ratio is? Is it something that you're comfortable with um, as, it, as it currently stands? Do you think it overly penalizes the Swedish banks, uh, given the, let's say, relative lack of uh, deposits in the system? Could you talk us through, I suppose, your thought, your thought process towards how you go about bringing in a, a Swedish NSFR? And then the second question would be uh, somewhat linked, really, in talking about the banks and their various currency positions. Um, it's also striking in the report that it seems uh, that the Swedish banks are broadly LCR compliant uh, in the major current currencies. Um, and I suppose that's your first mode of attack, really, on the currency debate, to bring in an LCR by currency. But clearly have some, somewhat of a shortfall if you look at an NSFR in dollars, for example. So... Could you talk us through whether you think that the LCR in dollars is the right way of capturing, uh, mis let's say, maturity mismatches I in dollars, uh, or whether you would in time aspire to bringing in something of an NSFR in each of the major currencies as well? Thank you. Okay. Uh, the first question, uh, looking at the, the structural liquidity measure, it, it's sure, the Swedish banks... Uh, you know, have some way to go to reach uh, 100 percent or below the average of European banks. And I think, you know, we, we fully understand that and we understand that there are reasons to that. Swedish banks have mortgage loans on the book, uh, on balance sheet, uh, 
that's not the case in, in part of Europe where they securitize the mortgages. Uh, we have had political and structural decisions taken 20 years ago that have uh, had implications on deposits. Sure, we, we fully understand that. But still, I think our view is more on the side that we actually want to see that the Swedish bank work, you know, and work actively on uh, the maturity of the funding. And what we have seen is that the Swedish banks have increased, uh, you know, the structural measure. They have improved uh, on their position. They have lengthened the maturity. It's just that we fully understand that there are, you know, peculiar, there are specific things that relates to how the Swedish banking sector looked like in Sweden that have implications for, for the, the measure for the Swedish banks. But having that said, we do think that there needs to be a structural measure in order to have you know, some kind of, of control over how much uh, maturity mismatching there actually are or maturity transformation there are in the banking sector. How that will be, uh, you know, the, fi the final construction of that measure as Stefan said, that's something that is being discussed in the Basel Committee. We will wait and, you know, wait and see what actually comes out. But you know, the important thing for, is, for us is to see that the Swedish banks are working actively on lengthening maturity, making sure that they actually do something about it. And I also think that the Swedish banks can do more. There is a natural investor that could you know, for, take, say for example, 20 year cover bond. You have life insurance and others. You know, it's a pricing issue, you know, fix it. You know, the, the Swedish banks know that there are investors. It's just that they can't, they can't meet on the price. You know, so they can solve part of, part of the problem, I think. Okay, when it comes to uh, the currency position, here I think, you know, on average, the Swedish bank seems to be compliant with, with the LCR. And that's fine, I think, again, I think the banks have actually been prudent, they have been working with it actively, that's good. And I think they need to do, you know, with the uncertainty that we have in markets today, they need to continue that work. Uh, currently, we haven't, you know, we, we are discussing uh, the mismatch, maturity mismatch in dollar, but that's, and that's also driven by the fact that we think you know, to one of the questions I had before, that there needs to be some funding in, in Swedish krona, and there is no short-term funding today. There needs to be a commercial paper market in Swedish krona, I think, and, and that, that's something that the banks need to consider. We are, we are not currently, of course, we work on a lot of stuff, uh, but currently we don't have any, you know, anything ready in our pockets on, on having a structural measure in, in different currencies. But, you know, maybe we should look into that, Nick. I mean, one way of putting it is to say that these these things <coughs> just will have to evolve over o over time. So, so when it comes to the, the 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 more finer technical parts of how you actually do these things, it it will have to evolve over time because all the work the re re more, more work remains to be to be done. So when it both when it comes to the NSFR, the LCR. And let's say even more so the LCR in in in, in, in different currencies, and uh, what we touched on earlier, how to technically design a countercyclical capital buffer. Uh, that's that's really a number of issues that we need to de need to deal with going uh, going uh, going forward. It's just not possible to to design these types of in instruments uh, with every imaginable technical detail being absolutely perfect from the uh, from the beginning so experience will have to be gained when it comes to dealing with this over over time but having said that the the basic concepts are very clear and and uh, what we and others want want to achieve when it comes to using these types of tools in order to to manage the you know, the basic risks and the basic concepts that I talked about that's that that that's not strange at all but then as always uh, uh, the devil is in the details thank you that's a, that's very clear could, could i maybe ask one very brief follow up question i'm very interested in this uh, topic of let's say trying to bring in from the us the the swedish banks short term funding supply or let's say creating a swedish commercial paper market can you even give us any kind of idea as to how you might uh, hope to achieve that or who the structural buyer would be in, in that kind of a market 
I, we don't have all, answers to all your questions, but uh, but I think there is there is a you know when I talk to the, when we talk to the Swedish banks, there is a interest in actually doing something about it. I think it's a structural problem that needs to be taken very seriously. And you know my understanding is that the, the banks are actually doing that. You know to find an investor again, I've, you know maybe I'm opt optimistic. It's a pricing issue, uh, and that's why that we don't have a commercial paper market today in, in Swedish Krona. Another, another way of putting putting it is in, in very very general terms is to say that usually and this this, this is not specific to, to to this country the more domestic markets you have the better off you are in the sense that you never know what's going to happen in the rest of the world and, and, and sort of money moves back and forth and and, and then it the hard part of it is, is that it takes time to create a domestic market infrastructure, if I, if I call, call it that. But uh, history tells us that in those countries and in those cases where domestic markets exist, you are usually better off compared to if th those markets do not exist at all in times of, in times of difficulties. So for many, many years in many places, this, this is not an issue at all. It's an issue which is barely discussed uh, because people tend to get used to the idea that you go and get the money from elsewhere. But one day there might be an issue and then normally you're better off if you can do it at home compared to having, having to get the funds from, from other, part, other, parts of, uh, other parts of the world. Thank you very much. Okay, it's almost five o'clock. I don't know if there are more questions, uh, reflections. If not, once again, this was a first on our side. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. And thank you also to all of you uh, who have been listening, listening in, in, uh, in various parts of the world. Thanks a lot.